ready to rock and roll. Yes, good we are. Morning, good afternoon and good evening to our global Nimble and guest community. My name is John Ferrara. I'm the CEO of Nimble and we're here with a webinar to help you grow better, smarter, faster in 2020. We're lucky enough to have Amy Franco with us. Say hi, Amy. Hello, everyone. Amy has written a uh, best-selling book uh, on Amazon called The Modern Seller. And I, and I think that the idea of the, the modern seller is so apropos because we need to become modern sellers for the modern buyer. The ways that we work, play, buy, and sell have radically changed in just the past few years, the past 10 years, and we need to change with them. And, uh, and Amy is all about inspiring, educating, uh, B2B sales and sales leadership uh, across verticals in order for them to achieve their goals. And you're also involved with the whole sales community uh, and sales bloggers. And ultimately, Amy, I think that if you teach people to fish, they figure out yourself fishing poles. And what I love about you is that you give you knowledge away on a daily basis. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for investing in yourself as we kick off a fantastic 2020 going after our goals for this year. Part of part of that is taking the time to invest in our own learning and development. So I appreciate all of you being here. Awesome. So um, let's go to the next one. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is John Ferrara. I'm the CEO of Nimble. Before I started Nimble, I pioneered contact management and CRM with a company called Goldmine that uh, essentially existed before Outlook or Salesforce existed. And I built that tool because I struggled as a salesperson. I struggled to manage relationships and sell at scale uh, at the enterprise level. And there wasn't a tool that integrated email, contact and calendar and sales and market automation. So I started that company and it turned out to be a goldmine for me. Uh, I got back in the business because I think that uh, that relationships are critical to your life success and that most CRMs are about reporting and, and not about relationships. So that's what Nimble's all about. And uh, and let's go to the agenda. All right, Amy, take us away. All right. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we are going to cover in this next uh, 45, 40, 45 minutes or so that we all have together. You know, I am. Um, I'm going to go to that that fourth bullet point first, where we talk about positioning ourselves as leaders with our prospects and clients. This, to me, is one of the biggest things that we can do in 2020 and beyond, is seeing ourselves as leaders with our prospects and clients. We aren't simply selling them a product or selling them a service, whatever it is that you happen to sell. We are leaders and the way that and when we embrace that mindset of leadership and we see ourselves as peers to our prospects and clients, problem solvers, strategic advisors, that's a different way of operating. So if that's one thing that I could just point to first, let's put ourselves into the mindset of being leaders because it takes on a different approach with our prospects and clients when we see ourselves in that way. So as we're having this conversation today, putting our leadership hats on and um, thinking about how I can take these ideas to really lead with my prospects and clients, because in the end, that is going to help us win those bigger deals, those higher margins, those higher value deals that really make the biggest difference to our organization. And if 60% of us or so on this line are uh, entrepreneurs, business owners. This, this is so important to us, especially for wearing a lot of different hats, because we have to be very selective with the types of prospects and clients that we are doing business with. So, so I'm going to start there. And then uh, some of the more practical things we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about some trends that uh, are creating chaos uh, in your sales status quo. And they're also creating chaos with your prospects and clients. So talking about that from two different lenses. We're then going to jump into the five dimensions of the modern seller. I'll give you a little backdrop on that, and then we're going to go through each of those five dimensions. And then I promise to give you ideas, some strategies that you could use to integrate these dimensions into your everyday sales activities. So my hope is that you walk away with one or two or three things that you can put into your sales practices today and really make the most of, of your 2020 and beyond. So with that, let's, uh, let's start talking about some trends. 
And uh, John, my friend John is going to jump in and ask me questions or give his thoughts as we go to. So this is going to be uh, conversational and uh, we'll take a look for your questions as well and see what we can get answered as we go. So you have an opportunity to jump in here. So I'm gonna talk about three trends. And uh, as I mentioned, these are really disrupting our sales status quo and making us have to think differently. And these are things that are also affecting your prospects and clients. So making sure that we're looking at it from the, both of those lenses. Our prospects and clients are, are dealing with this thing that I call a new sales economy. They are constantly dealing with ever shifting business dynamics, technology trends, cultural change, and all of those things are happening. They're happening to us and they're happening to our prospects and clients. And the result of that is that their expectations of us have changed. We have to change our mindset. We need new mental models. We need new skill sets and tool sets in order to help them be successful. And when we help them be successful, we become more successful. So that, that's the, the underlying swirl of things that are happening with our prospects and clients. So we have to change our own game in order to help them become better. So the first you know, trend- I, I, yeah. I just wanna interject something here. Please. One of the things that I think a theme of what I've heard you say so far is that uh, leadership in sales is not about making the most numbers or bagging and tagging the most customers. It's really serving the most people and helping them grow. And I think that service is the new sales. The mindset of a salesperson should be, how can I help this person grow? And if you have that mindset when you're entering a deal in this, as opposed to, you know, what can I do to close this person? I think that it shifts the relationship and uh, and empowers your success. And I think that's one of the things I've, I've heard as a thread. I just wanted to interject that. And to that point, going back to our poll question, when 27% of you said your top source of sales opportunities are existing customers and 29% referrals, that point that you just shared and this idea of leadership and thinking of ourselves as leaders, that is what drives those percentages. That's why people trust us and they continue to come back to us or they refer someone to us because we are in that we are in that leadership role. And we, of course, we also have a fantastic product or service and what we're helping them to solve a problem. So exactly. All right, so let's talk world of sameness for a moment. So our brains are wired to look for patterns. In any given day, our brain makes upwards of 30,000 decisions. Now, lucky for us, a lot of those decisions are automatic automatic decisions within uh, within our brains. But you think about making all those types of decisions and how many of those decisions in a given day are those executive thinking, high level type of decisions. And because we're making so many decisions in a day, our brain starts to look for patterns and starts to routinize things. And so what can happen is we can very easily start to look like everyone else in the eyes of a prospect or a client. And, and a story that, that kind of brings this to life, I, I was working with a client who shared this story with me. And uh, in this particular situation, the, the client was in an RFP situation. So if you do RFPs, proposals, pursuits, you might be able to, to relate to this one. So they were invited to present to the prospect and they were one of four for competitors that were invited to present. And in this particular situation, they were all in the same room together, my client and three other competitors. And there was this light bulb moment during this process where my client was looking at their presentation and said, oh my gosh, I look like every other competitor. They all had similar presentations most of them about themselves as the organization, not necessarily focused on the prospect or the client. And there was just this terrifying light bulb moment that I look the same as everyone else. No one stood out. And that is what happens when we are not necessarily as focused on the prospect or client and their, their challenges, their opportunities as we could be. And we start to look inward for what it is that we do. We start to look like everyone else. And what happens when we start to look like everyone else is that the prospect or the client starts to assign what they see as meaningful. 
what's meaningful and memorable to them. And typically where that goes is they start to look at price as a differentiator. So the lesson for all of us is that in order to combat this world of sameness, we have to continually look for ways to be different in the eyes of our prospect and our clients. So that's the world of sameness. And your prospects and clients are dealing with the same thing with their own customers. So it, it's, it rolls downhill, if you will, um, and they are dealing with it too. So this world of sameness is something that, they're, that your prospects and clients are dealing with in their own customer sets as well. All right, here's the next one, accelerated ROI. So th this, this story that I'm about to share is, is about me. And I was uh, in a sales meeting with a bank, uh, bank CEO and uh, local, local president, I should say, and a chief sales officer. All right. So I'm sitting in this meeting with these two individuals and we had had a number of meetings uh, coming up to this point. So here I am thinking, we're, I'm, I have a contract with me. We're going to cross a couple T's. We're going to dot some I's, maybe review some terms and conditions and away we go, right? Well, not so fast. I'm sitting in this meeting and we are talking about different sales training solutions. So in, in my, in my everyday world, I am a sales keynote speaker and then, um, uh, sales training solutions as well. So this is what that particular meeting was about. So the uh, local president starts to get this really thoughtful look on her face. And here is the question that she asked me. She said, Amy, I need to be able to go to the CEO of this organization and in three bullet points, be able to share with him how our work together is going to make a meaningful difference. We're going to move the needle was the phrase that she used in the next 90 days, all right? How are we going to move the needle in the next 90 days? I was not prepared for that question and I should have been because I did not have a great, concise, well thought out answer to that. So that was a painful lesson that I took away from that. The second lesson that I took away is that most of our prospects and clients, while they are all maybe going to annual results, they have annual results that they have to deliver, but they, in reality, are working quarter to quarter, quarter to quarter. They're racing from one priority to the next, and priorities can really switch on a dime. And what the lesson for us is that when we can help them focus on how our work together can help them meet some short-term goals and really being crystal clear on the two or three most important uh, return on investment points that we can be helping them to accomplish, we're going to improve our odds of earning their business. So how many times have we been in a scenario where something gets uh, kicked down the road by a quarter or two because another priority took place over what it was that we were looking to solve? Our clients and prospects have become a lot more sophisticated in terms of return on investment, and they are looking for accelerated return on investment because many times they are under pressure to uh, deliver results to their business. You know, on, on this point, Amy, I, yeah. I think that people don't buy great products and buy better versions of themselves. And so I think the mistake many salespeople make is they go in and they start talking about themselves and their products as opposed to listening to learn to find ways to add value. And ultimately, what you should be doing is uh, finding a way to help that person grow. And I think if yes. salespeople are focused on um selling somebody a better version of themselves like and that's exactly what you're talking about is like what am i going to get out of this what's my roi and i think it's uh it's a great point one, one of the things and that this is this is something tactical that that you could put into your into your sales activities uh really right now if you're not already doing it is um especially for uh publicly traded organizations and even some uh, smaller organizations looking for their annual reports or any presentation that's delivered by a CEO or executive in the organization where you can uncover what their key goals are for the year. And then you can use that to drive a conversation with the prospect or client and understand from them, to your point about being a better version of themselves, understand from them how these goals are affecting them and what they want to accomplish in the business. And what that does is it starts to piece together a, an ROI vision, if you will, 
and then getting from them crystal clarity on the two or three things that are most important so all of your future sales conversations can be around that and you can actually help them accelerate their ROI. All right, last one, last one, decision by committee. What I'm seeing consistently happen, and it's, I, I have my own experiences with this as well as uh, research that is done by a number of organizations on the number of decision makers and influencers within uh, specific opportunities. The more complex the opportunity, the more influencers and decision makers are being inserted into the sales process. Now, while I still believe that in the end, there is typically one person that is responsible for saying yes or no to us in order to move forward, it, it pays to pay attention to who else is involved in the decision-making process and who might be in that decision-maker's ear sharing information with, with him or her. Many times we are so used to building relationships within the departments or the divisions where we're comfortable or where our product, product or solution seems to have a fit. What we miss out on that, what we miss out on though, is that we miss sometimes relationships that can be built across the organization and sometimes even outside the organization, depending on the type of product or service that you sell. So many times for us, we have relationship gaps. And when we have a relationship gap, it increases the risk of somebody, if we don't, we have a relationship gap and increases the risk of somebody potentially being able to influence a decision maker or set of decision makers. And we don't know about it until it is too late and a different decision has been made. So the more complex the opportunity, the more people that are involved and the more that the onus is on us to be building those relationships. And John, at the top of the hour, that was one of the very first things that you said, that this is about relationships and not just about you know, tasks in a CRM or deals in a CRM and figuring out where we might be having some relationship gaps. So we, that, you if, know, you, if you have anything you'd like to add on that one. I actually do. So there's book, there's books that inspired me to build Goldmine and Nimble. The book that inspired me to build Goldmine was a book called Strategic Selling by uh, Miller Hyman, Alice Hyman's father. I don't know if you know Alice, but if you don't, I'm happy. I do know Alice. She is okay. fantastic. She is. But that book opened up my eyes to the value of identifying the different decision makers and the role players in a company so you have a technical buyer, you have a financial buyer, et cetera, et cetera. And you you can get blindsided if all you're talking to is the, the product decision maker as opposed to the financial or the business decision makers. And so it's critical what you're talking about here. And if you want to read a book about that, I'm sure there's newer ones that look at it differently, is a book called Strategic Selling. And, and one, other, one, one place where I, I fell into a trap big time uh, when it came to this decision by committee was um, I sold a lot into public sector earlier in my career. And in many cases, a, a board of directors was responsible for the final vote approving the products and services that I sold. And uh, one time I, I painfully lost a very large opportunity because I wasn't aware of that. And those were some relationships that I didn't have. And it ultimately cost me a large opportunity because I just wasn't aware that they were part of the decision-making process. So the more awareness that we build around this and then seeing where the gaps are, the better the odds are we have of closing those gaps and in earning those opportunities. All right, so we've talked about trends and thinking about this in the lens of your own opportunities, but also through the lens of your prospects and customers. If we can help them overcome some of those trends, we elevate ourselves in their, their eyes and we become that modern seller in their eyes. So I'm going to put three uh, working definitions here on the screen. When I wrote the modern seller, I wanted to have an anchor point for the definition of the modern seller. And so this definition I created uh, from my own experience as well as the, the research and the interviews that I did in order to write the book. So the mod um, someone who is a modern seller is someone who is recognized as a differentiator in your client's business. You're recognized by them. They see it. You are the difference maker for them. And this, this middle one I, I think is so important. 
the value of your product or service, no matter what it is that you sell, isn't fully realized without you as part of the equation. Your expertise, your advisement, your leadership in the eyes of the prospect or client really can't be separated from your product or service. And then lastly, your prospect or client uh, views you as strategic to their competitive advantage. They can't imagine not having you on the team. You almost become an insider in a way because you're, you have helped them to, you're kind of their secret weapon, if you will. And they can't imagine not doing business without you. So th this is my working definition of the modern seller. And if we run our clients and our prospects through this filter, what would they be thinking about us? What might they say about us? And will we live up to this definition in their eyes? So now we have this working definition here and the rest of the time I wanna spend just digging into these five dimensions and giving you some strategies that can help you to bring these to life in your own book of business, in your teams, whatever your particular situation happens to be. So the catalyst for the modern seller was that I was seeing the need to talk about some skills behind the skills that make us better as sellers and as business leaders. Now, things like prospecting, presenting, negotiating, closing, those things don't, don't go away. They are very important sales activities. But I was seeing some skills behind the skills, more foundational, if you will, that can help us to be better at those everyday sales activities. So the combination of the, the tools that we use, like Nimble, the skills that we put into play, the leadership that we bring, all of these things work together. So now what I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about each of these and give you a, a strategy or two that you can put into play. So a modern seller is agile, entrepreneurial, holistic, social, and an ambassador. So I'm going to hit the first one, that a modern seller is agile. I like to think of agility as a growth mindset. Agility is a little bit of a buzzword these days. Uh, it, it's something that wasn't even on the radar probably in the last decade. It used to be reserved for uh, for sports teams and in the, in the uh, sports arena. Now it's made its way into the business arena. And agility is actually a top five skill that organizations are looking to hire for and to develop. The good news is, is that this is a skill that can be built. So agility is really being able to see ahead of the curve. It is being able to, being comfortable with change, lots of change. It is being comfortable with having to, uh, you're comfortable, you, you, even if you don't know what's around the corner, you can anticipate it and you're comfortable with not knowing what you don't know. You will go and figure it out. People who are agile have a very high figure it out factor. And one hallmark of someone who is agile, we are getting more and more information thrown at us every day, and that is going to continue to grow exponentially. But someone who is agile is excellent at being able to filter and process lots of information and being able to curate out what's most important. And especially in a sales situation, think about it sitting in a prospect or a client meeting, they're dealing with that same thing. They are inundated with information. Imagine being able to rely on us to help them curate what's happening and being able to bring them fresh new ideas for their business. Agility makes them more innovative. It makes them more immune to competitive pressures and it is ultimately going to help them thrive. So when we build this in ourselves, we can help our prospects and our customers thrive as well. So one strategy that you can put into play is what uh, I refer to as pattern switching. There's a great book that I'm going to recommend, and it's all about building habits. It's, it's called The Power of Habit, and it's by Charles Duhigg. Um, if, you, if you haven't read this book, I would highly recommend picking it up um, because he talks a lot about how we uh, as human beings uh, build habits and how can we bust uh, habits that are no longer serving us. But analyzing your selling patterns is a way to practice pattern switching. I referred to earlier on that our brain makes 30,000 decisions every day and we are always looking for patterns. It is really, there, there is not a whole lot of difference between a pattern and then a rut. It is easy to go from something that is pattern to routine to rut. And so I'll use myself as an example here. I was in a prospecting rut 
what had become a pattern and a routine had really fallen into a rut and I just was not getting the prospecting results that I wanted. I was procrastinating on it. I just wasn't doing it. And uh, maybe you might be uh, silently raising your hands and visibly raising your hands and having the same challenge. I'm with you. But I had to practice pattern switching. I had to analyze what I was doing and insert a new routine and change the environment that I was in. Those are the two things that you do with pattern switching. New routine and new environment. So I had this, I had, a, I had this rut with uh, prospecting. So I, and I had an outside coach help me to uncover this. And so sometimes we need that outside perspective because we just don't see our own patterns and ruts, right? So I had, an, I had a coach uh, suggest to me that I might look at uh, making some changes. And after a little bit of introspection and realizing I needed a new environment and I needed to, um, I needed a new set of routines. So I put myself into a different office environment which forced me to change my routines. I had to be more prepared with my lists. I had to focus my time. I even changed the way that I dressed. I went from being casual to being in more a business attire, which changed my mindset and really helped me to be more prepared as well. So that change of environment, going from a home office environment to a regular office environment, helped to spur other routines that then ultimately helped me to create better, more productive results. So looking at some things in your own selling habits and selling patterns that might need a little bit of pattern switching, if it's either doing that in yourself or if you're a leader of a team, helping your team to uncover that and to help you become more productive. All right, so that's pattern switching and that's building agility. Let's go on to the next one. All right, a modern seller is entrepreneurial. Someone who thinks and acts like an entrepreneur, they don't just see themselves as employees of the organization. So I'm speaking to probably a lot of entrepreneurs here, so we're, we're on the hopefully on the same page. They don't just see themselves as employees. They see themselves as the founders, the CEOs, the chief bootstrappers of their book of business, of their territory, whatever that is. And when you see yourself as an owner, you make different decisions and you're thinking differently. You're looking at the top line of your territory, the bottom line of your territory. You're looking at your best client opportunities. You're assessing risk. You are thinking holistically, which will be my next one, but you're thinking holistically about the business or the territory and you make different decisions. If we had a team of entrepreneurial sellers or entrepreneurial thinkers in our businesses, we can get further faster. And especially for those of you that are looking to um, open a new market, open a new vertical, these are the kinds of sellers that you want to be uh, have on your teams or your strategic partners that you wanna be partnered up with. So one strategy to help build that entrepreneurial muscle is what I like to call diamonds in the rough. We are so conditioned to look at where our competitors are. Where's our competition at? Who are they calling on? How do we beat them? And I'm not, that doesn't go away, but another way to look at it and to turn this on your head, on its head, is to ask yourself the question, where aren't my competitors? Because where our competition isn't can provide a really interesting insight to where we might go and be first. Where aren't my competitors? And where is there an underserved niche or market that I can dominate? So let me give you a quick example of this. I was doing a sales workshop for a client that's in the insurance space. And we were talking about this particular, this particular strategy. And what this, um, what this seller had uncovered was a diamonds in the rough. So this is someone who sells in commercial insurance. You talk about being in a world of sameness and being challenged by that. Uh, the great thing is everyone needs insurance. The bad thing is everyone needs insurance. So it's really easy to look the same. So what this particular seller was able to do was he found an underserved market in the healthcare space. So healthcare, huge, huge vertical, right? He found a niche in the healthcare space that had to do with nonprofits dealing with organ donation of all things. They need insurance as well. And he happened to uh, he he happened into this niche through uh, some referrals and through a conference, actually. 
and he was able to start dominating this niche in being seen as the go-to expert and provider in this space. So he was able to dominate that niche, he was able to get ahead of it, and it became a very uh, valuable, profitable, but also from the, the mind of, of service, able to serve this niche that really wasn't being served well. So where in your book of business, in your company, can you might, where, where might you find some of these diamonds in the rough? John, do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, I, I think that uh, a lot of people um, skate to the puck and I think that you need to skate to where you think the puck's going to go mm -hmm. because everybody's skating to the puck. And so I think a good way to differentiate yourself is to, is to find your niche. And, uh, and that's kind of like what we do at Nimble is that if everybody's selling the same thing, a CRM that does reporting and management of salespeople, we really focus on a CRM that's about relationships. And so I think that you do need to stand out from the crowd and differentiate yourself. And, uh, and, and, and by doing so, you'll be seen. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's a different way where, where aren't my competitors? So it, you're almost answering that question, where aren't my competitors and how, how, can, I, how can I dominate a, a specific niche? Um, so for, the, for all of us here, thinking about your own books of business and where can you maybe apply this one? All right, next one. A modern seller is holistic. A modern seller who is holistic realizes that and understands that in any given day, we have a finite amount of reserves when it comes to time, energy, motivation, and discipline. And the choices that we make with those precious resources directly impacts our sales results. We may not see that right away, but over time, those choices that we make with those resources and where we decide to focus those resources absolutely determines whether or not we will be successful or if we get to the end of a year, end of a quarter, if we have some gaps to make up. So when we're thinking holistically, a way to think holistically is to apply supply chain thinking to your organization, to your territory, whatever this happens to look like for you. So one way you can do this is to map out every pre-sales and post-sales touch point. technology gremlin, my apologies. So map out every pre-sales and post-sales touch point. When you do this, you start to see patterns, you start to see patterns in every single touch point with your prospect or your client experience. How many times do we think about our own internal sales process, but we don't take the time to think about how that sales process bumps up against how a prospect or a client buys? If we were to do a simple exercise of mapping out our sales process and then mapping out a prospect or a client's buying process, we might be very surprised at where there are some gaps in the way that they are thinking and the way that we are thinking. So that, that's one, one thing that you can do today is to map out that prospect, a process. And maybe you do it with a, with a great client. You sit down with them and it's a, it's a touch point where you say, I, we really want to get better at our customer experience process. We'd like to understand more about, let's let's dig into your thought processes so we could map it and we get better for you. And then that becomes intelligence that you can use with future prospects or other customers and clients. The other piece to this puzzle is to be thinking about all of the external touch points that ultimately hit your prospect or client. Um, so let me give you an example of that. When I was at uh, when I was at IBM, I sold uh, PCs, laptops, uh, mobile computing, uh, hardware, and services. When I earned the sale, as many steps as that took, it was truly just step one in a very long, complex process of being able to fulfill on the delivery and the promise to the customer. Uh, logistics were involved, customer service teams were involved, uh, product teams were involved, manufacturing was involved. Many times we think that 
it, we, we look a little too narrowly at who is involved in making the customer happy and making sure that we're delivering on the process. So do you have relationships and do you understand really fully the process that happens? Because in my in, in scenario, if any one of those, uh, there was a, a gap in the process for every single one of those, any, any of those, it would affect the it would affect the uh, prospect or the client's uh, experience. And we may not deliver on time, we may deliver a substandard product. So looking at all the different touch points in and around the prospect or client experience is what's going to help you to be that modern seller because you're thinking holistically and not just about your particular piece in the chain. So Amy? mapping out those, yeah, go ahead, John. Can I interject on this? Because I really Please. think this is an important point that many businesses drop the ball on uh, here. And when I was selling enterprise network operating systems for Banyan Vines in Dallas, I was part of a field sales organization and we had uh, sales managers and, and pre and post sales SEs and uh, the administrator of the office. And then we had the people back at corporate we dealt with which included sales leadership, but it also included product and shipping and all these other people. And any one of those people can help you drop the ball uh, in, in a, a deal. And so I think that the big mistake that people make is they think it's just prospects and customers that touch sales and marketing people, but it really takes the whole company the whole company touching not just prospects and customers, but the constituency around your office. And if you think about it that way, then CRM isn't really just about salespeople. You need a system record of relationship across all siloed departments so that the customer journey has all the touch points and all the communications unified so that everybody's on one page so nothing gets dropped through the crack. Absolutely. And that 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 that, that concept right there, I think about um, whole company selling uh, along, along those those concepts when we when no matter where we happen to sit in the business, if we really think about ourselves as being that client facing, I'm responsible for the client customer experience. So they continue to buy from us. That right there, being able to deliver well can exponentially increase our odds of earning continued business in the future and being able to grow into other areas of the business. So for anybody here who is looking to grow your existing customer base, this can be one way to do it, that this particular strategy here. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, moder a modern seller is social. A modern seller who embraces this social aspect of selling, and it's not just social media. I embrace social as strategic relationship building, regardless of the tools that we use. So, in, so using a, tim, a tool like Nimble uh, builds relationships, whatever your other uh, social platforms may be, it all comes together to help you build those right strategic relationships. This is about, strategic productivity when it comes to relationship building. We have lots and lots of contacts in our CRM, in our social platforms and our social circles, even just sitting in our phones, but we don't necessarily have all of these as relationships. So we have to be able to select and build social capital with the right relationships in order to move our businesses forward, in order to move our um, sales territories forward. The best way that I have found to do this is to wrap my mind around my key goals for the year. What are my key selling goals, my key business goals for the year? And what are the most important relationships that I need to be building? That's your relationship ecosystem. The relationships that you need to be building and you add value to these people, it's mutual value, but you add value to these people and you build those relationships with them in order to meet your biggest goals. None of us meet significant goals without other people. Nothing significant that we achieve, we don't do it alone. It, ta it takes a village and it takes building relationships and seeing ourselves as a relationship builder, taking on the mindset. We talked about the mindset of a leader. I also believe in the mindset of being a relationship builder as well. 
So that that is the that is what it means to be a modern seller who embraces uh, the social aspect of it. And a couple one well one strategy that I'll give you to think about in your business or in your sales territory is looking at these four types of relationships and bumping it up against your key goals or a key client or prospect that you're looking to to get into. You can look at this in a number of ways. But let's look at it in terms of building your business or getting into a particular prospect or client. So the first set of relationships that's critical for us are advocates. Advocates are willing to leverage his or her social capital to open doors. They may actively sponsor you for a key opportunity. Um, and in social capital, social capital to me is the, the value that we put into relationships and the results that we create together from building those relationships. So that, that's how I define social capital and people who are advocates are willing to leverage theirs on our behalf. So this could be a referral. It could be someone who is already within an existing client who opens a door for you. Um, for those of you that are building a new market or vertical, who are the advocates in those markets or verticals that you can be building relationships with? So that's one group. Your second group is your decision makers. Uh, your decision makers are those who are going to hold ultimate budget authority. They're going to hold the decision to move forward. And uh, just a word of awareness is there, there could be multiple influencers for a decision maker and you could bump up against that decision by committee. So being aware of who is in their center of influence, those decision maker center of influence that you might need to be building relationships with as well. Which leads me to the third one, which are centers of influence. I define a center of influence as either a person or it could be an organization, people or organizations. And what that person does or that organization does is they provide an environment, they provide strategies, they provide opportunities, they provide access. A center of influence is not always an advocate for us but many times someone who is an advocate is a center of influence. So being aware of who those centers of influence are and paying attention to who can also advocate for us. And one thing I always try to remember is we are centers of influence for others. We may not always see ourselves in that way, but when we are becoming those leaders and we are, we are uh, raising our profiles in our communities, if you will, we can be centers of influence for other people. And then my last one, this one is near and dear to my heart and uh, probably one of the biggest reasons that I've been able to build the, build the business and the company that I have are strategic alliances. And those are partnerships that create mutually beneficial opportunities and they're typically revenue generating. When I look at my own book of business and I look at where my opportunities come from, over 90% of them come from a combination of referral and my strategic alliances or my partnerships. So this is focusing on, on this particular group can absolutely help you grow exponentially and help you attract higher value prospects and clients to be working with. So as you're looking at your book of business, you are working with your teams or looking at a specific opportunity that you're looking to move forward, these four sets of relationships will help you move forward faster and will help you build more rewarding opportunities. All right, last one. A modern seller is an ambassador. This is probably the one of the five that gets the most uh, interest or like, hmm, tell me more about that one. I, I, this, this is, it, it's something new, something I hadn't considered before. So a modern seller who is an ambassador I like to think of an ambassador as a bridge. In a, in a global sense, an ambassador is a bridge between countries and cultures. In a business sense, an ambassador is also a bridge. We are a bridge into our prospects. We're a bridge into our clients. We are a bridge into our communities, with our partners, into our industry. We have opportunities to build bridges wherever we go in order to elevate our opportunities and elevate our results. And one thing that really helps an ambassador stand out, well, two things. First is an ambassador really espouses the values of his or her organization while also standing tall in his or 
his or her own unique brand. What makes them different? What makes them stand out in the eyes of their prospects or clients? The second thing that they do really well, and I think this comes back around to one of the points that we made earlier, was that someone who thinks like an ambassador, they are fantastic at taking even the smallest win and they deliver so well on it that the, that springboards into longer term loyalty and life, longer term lifetime value. They are able to build loyalty with their clients and customers, which then leads to future opportunities and they can grow exponentially within that particular client. So here is a strategy that, that I have found to be very helpful in, in building uh, loyalty. Our prospects and clients tend to see value in one of two ways. They tend to see it either as a table stake or they see it as a differentiator. A table stake is something that is just a ticket to entry. We all have, in a competitive situation, are, we tend to look the same in this regard. We have, we have competitive pricing. We uh, have uh, strong products and solutions. These are all things that are expected of us even when we walk in the door. We won't get, we won't even earn the conversation without having these table stakes things. The, the problem that I see or the trap that I see many sellers fall into is positioning, taking a table stake and trying to position it as a differentiator. A differentiator is something that makes us look different in the eyes of a prospect or a client. And it is going to be a little bit different in each prospect or client. But what are those higher value things that we can deliver on that make us look different? That is what helps us to stand out. So one example that, that I have seen with my own clients is when I leverage my network and make introductions to resources or to other people with my key clients and even with my prospects, that has been a differentiator in their eyes. I move up the value chain in their eyes, if you will. So the more that we can hone in on what makes the biggest difference to them, and then we deliver on what makes a difference, the more that we have the capacity to be able to build loyalty in their eyes. So it can be as simple as going to our best clients and asking them, what are the three things that make us really stand out to you? I guarantee you that nobody else is asking them that question. And if we were to ask them that question and we get what those three things are, then we can use that as a springboard to keep delivering on it and we continue to get, gather more intelligence about that client so that we can earn the right for other business within that client. And then taking that same concept and applying it to our prospects. What are the three things that will make us the most different in your eyes that we can pay attention to as we continue to build a relationship together? So that is one strategy for building loyalty and becoming an ambassador in the eyes of our prospects or clients. So, so to wrap up, we have just a few minutes before we get to the top of the hour. We covered a lot in the last uh, 40 minutes or so. We talked about some trends, we defined the modern seller, and then we uh, dove into the five dimensions of modern selling. Agile, entrepreneurial, holistic, social, and ambassador. So one call to action that, uh, that I would encourage, encourage you to take is to choose one of those dimensions that really stood out to you the most and pick one of the strategies that we talked about and put it into practice in your company, in your book of business. And so, so with that, we will talk about a few special offers uh, that we have. So I will start with, with my, uh, my offer, my gift to all of you, uh, the Modern Seller Inventories. So in the book, The Modern Seller, I have four inventories that I'm going to provide to you um, that will help you in a number of ways. There's one on customer value, there's one on loyalty, one on relationships, and one on personal branding. You can use these inventories for yourself or you can use them with your team to help you uh, elevate in those uh, four areas. And then uh, John, I will hand it over to you for, uh, for Nimble's offer. Well, Amy, first off, I just wanna thank you for your wisdom in regards to the, the modern seller engaging with the modern buyer. One of the things that you were talking about in regards to uh, engaging with your constituency in order to build 
your thought leadership to stand out as a trusted advisor really resonated with me. My wife took me into our garden uh, uh, a while back and she showed me a monarch butterfly caterpillar in our yard and I asked her, what's a monarch butterfly caterpillar doing in our yard? And she said that she plants milk thistle in order to attract monarch butterfly caterpillars which eat the aphids so she doesn't have to spray. And then she went on to tell me how she creates this self-sustaining garden by planting certain things that attract other things that creates this the beautiful things that we have in our in our in our house including the herbs and the flowers and the vegetables etc and i thought to myself isn't this what we're trying to do as human beings as business people in our personal lives as well is to uh is to basically create a self-sustaining garden of relationships that are not just prospects and customers but it's for me, it's editors, analysts, bloggers, influencers, third-party developers, investors, advisors, and prospects and customers. And I call that a constituency. And you need to be able to build this in your life. And um, and so I I loved hearing your your wisdom. It certainly resonated with me. Uh, there's an offer that we have for those that haven't tried Nimble yet, and uh, and they can go ahead and uh, sign up for a 30-day trial. Normally, it's two weeks, and if they like what they see. They can get 40% off by using the code John40 when they uh, convert. Uh, and with that, there uh, there were some questions. And uh, Michaela, I hope, shared with you the, uh, the Q&A page uh, just to get some maintenance out of the way. Everybody's going to get a copy of the recording. Uh, Amy, Amy, would it be OK if we shared your deck as well with them? Yes, absolutely. OK. And, uh, and then there were uh, some uh, questions. People wanted to know the book name or the author name of the book that you were talking about. Uh, and I think it, I think I put it in the chat window here, but maybe you could just verify um, the the name of the the book. Yeah, the one earlier on, um, I, it, The Power of Habit. And yep. the, uh, the author is Charles Duhigg, D-U-H. I G G. Perfect. Charles. Dewey. So I did. I did put that in the chat window for those that uh, that are looking for that. We'll also put it in the follow up email. Uh, and um, and then somebody said that it's great sales advice, but they're hoping that they would focus on how to take these principles and apply them to nimble. And unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour, but I do want to say that. We do a weekly webinar, 45 minutes, if you go to nimble.com forward slash webinars, where we do the CRM basics and do cover that. Plus, we have a number of videos that are recorded that do cover how to apply the concepts that Amy's talking about, about, uh, about setting yourself up as a trusted advisor and engaging with the intent to serve and grow others. Um, uh, all of these ideas we talk about how to put them in practice in those webinars and in the recordings. Um, and with that, Amy, uh, I want to uh, thank you. I want to thank the audience for coming. Do you have any closing thoughts? You know, I think uh, one one closing thought and just to just to wrap up the um, the conversation that we started with is that all of this is very much a leadership conversation as it is anything else. I think you alluded to it perfectly when you talked about all the different constituents. Um, when we see ourselves as business leaders, when we see ourselves as advisors and we apply these principles, we are going to grow our books of business. We're going to grow as, as people. We're going to grow as leaders. And that's what's really going to help us change our communities. Uh, it's going to help us uh, just be, be that difference maker, not just for our prospects and clients, but really be a difference maker in the world around us. So, so I will leave us with that. Great. And then here's our contact info. Please reach out to uh, each of us on whatever channel is most effective for you and let us know how we can blow some wind in your sales today. I want to shout out Paul Bocher, who happens to have put some great uh, advice in the uh, chat window and just thank everybody for their valuable time today. Uh, have an amazing Thursday and uh, and a great weekend as it approaches. I think it's Martin Luther King's a weekend this weekend, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes, okay. So uh, there it is. Uh, good luck and good selling. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.